Like the weasel, the American marten and the fisher are both members of the mustelid or weasel family. They have certain biological characteristics in common, such as musk glands and a delayed implantation period. Therefore, we will examine both of these solitary animals. The fisher is also known as the pecan, which comes from the Algonquin word for the animal. In Cree, it is known as the ochik, and its scientific name is Martis penanti. Fishers have pointed heads and thick necks, and are identified by their small round ears, short muscular legs, and long bushy tails. The adult male normally weighs between three and a half and five and a half kilograms, eight to twelve pounds, and measures about a meter, approximately forty inches, from his pointed nose to the tip of his tail. The average weight of the female is about half that of the male, 1.8 to 2.7 kilograms, or 4 to 6 pounds, and her total length is just 75 centimeters, 30 inches. The fisher's fur varies from grayish brown to black, and is lighter on the sides and darker on the rump and tail. The face, neck, and shoulder fur is grizzled with gray or light brown hairs. The male's fur is grayer and coarser than the female's fur, which is lighter and glossier. The fisher is a carnivore, equipped with sharp claws and strong jaws, which hold 38 teeth. Both sexes of the fisher have two types of musk glands, used for marking territory. One pair of anal glands and a second pair of small glands in the pads of the hind paws. The American marten is smaller than the fisher and has a long slender body, a small head with a short pointed nose, large round ears and dark brown eyes. The average length of the male varies between 50 and 63 centimeters, 20 to 25 inches, including its tail. It weighs from 690 to 900 grams, one and a half to two pounds. Females are smaller and weigh about a third less than males. The marten's fur is generally golden brown, but can vary from yellow to dark brown. The head is usually lighter and the legs darker. The ears are outlined in white, and there may be an orange-yellow patch on the throat and part of the breast. Martins can hunt equally well at night or during the day, due to highly developed senses of sight, hearing, and scent. Their teeth are similar to those of the fisher. Its short legs end in furry pads with semi-retractable claws. Both males and females have two types of musk glands, anal glands found at the base of the tail and an abdominal gland. The fissure is found only in North America. It is spread over all the provinces and territories of Canada, with the exception of Prince Edward Island and the island of Newfoundland. As its name suggests, the American Martin is found only in North America. It can be found in almost all Canadian forests, with the exception of Prince Edward Island. Both the Fisher and the American Martin are solitary hunters and are able to adapt to various types of forests. Martins tend to avoid open spaces, preferring mature conifer stands and mixed forests. The fisher, on the other hand, can adapt to more of a variety of habitats. The fisher makes its home in hollow trees, under large boulders, and in the dense growth of small trees or bushes. Its favorite nesting place is the crown of a hollow deciduous tree. The male's territory may cover as many as 25 square kilometers, 10 square miles, and the females as many as 17 square kilometers, 7 square miles. The distance will vary according to the amount of available food. The American Martin makes its home in the hollow of a tree, 
under a fallen tree, in the hollow of a cliff, or even in a squirrel's nest. In a favorable habitat, the male's territory is two or three square kilometers, one square mile, while the female's is about half of that. The fisher is one of the rare animals that feeds on porcupines, killing them by repeated bites to the head. Fishers also eat hares, grouse, squirrels, small birds, and their eggs and even carrion. Martins feed mostly on small mammals, particularly red-backed voles. They also eat grouse and hares. In the summer and the fall, they feed on various fruits, berries, and seeds. Martins and fishers associate with other members of their respective species is during the short mating season. At all other times, they are solitary hunters. The reproductive cycles of both of these animals are rather unusual. There is a period of delayed implantation during which the tiny embryo remains dormant. This dormancy lasts about 10 months in the fisher and 7 to 8 months in the marten. After this period, the embryo attaches itself to the walls of the oviduct, and the real gestation begins. Although male fishers can produce sperm at one year of age, they don't become efficient procreators until their second year. Female fishers are sexually mature at one year. Mating season usually begins at the end of March, six or eight days after the female has given birth, and it lasts until mid-April. Then the deferred implantation period begins. The length of the actual gestation period isn't known. It is somewhere between 30 and 60 days. The litter is born in mid-March, 51 weeks after mating. The male and female American Martin reach sexual maturity at about 15 months. They mate in July and August, the male often mating with several females. The real gestation period only lasts 27 days on the average. The young are generally born in the middle of April. Fishers usually have three young. They leave their mothers in the fall when they have attained adult size. Martins too usually have three young. Both Martin and Fisher females usually choose a hollow tree in which to give birth to their young. ovarian spots enables biologists to determine the maximum number of young that the female fishers and martins could have had. There are two ways of determining the age of a martin or a fisher. First, it is possible to separate the young from the adults by x-raying their canine teeth. Second, counting the age rings in the roots of the teeth reveals the exact number of years an animal has lived. Fishers and martens do not have very many causes of death. To begin with, the fisher has no known natural predator, and neither diseases nor parasites seem to cause many fisher deaths. Like the fisher, the marten has few natural enemies. Although its agility in tree climbing protects it from carnivores on the ground, certain birds may prey on fishers. The destruction of its habitat, indiscriminate lumbering, severe weather during the raising of the young, 
as well as trapping, are the main factors that affect marten and fisher populations. The American marten and the fisher are only found in North America. Although the fisher is better adapted to a wider variety of habitats, it is just as vulnerable as the marten to the destruction of its living environment and to over-harvesting. Fortunately, a better understanding of their biology has resulted in better management of these valuable species. Trapping licenses in each province or territory provide better control over the number of trappers. These trap lines, assigned according to the regulations in effect in each jurisdiction, ensure better management of the resource. The trapping seasons are set in each jurisdiction according to two factors, the reproductive cycle of each species and the quality or primeness of the fur. When trapping starts in the fall, young martens have more or less reached adult size and the quality of their fur is similar to that of adults. Opting for an early harvest means that many more young than adults are taken. Thus, fewer adult females who will produce young the following spring are harvested. Besides, the young have a greater risk of dying of natural causes than do the adults who have already established their territories. For the same reasons, early harvesting of fishers favors a better population balance. But in their case, the trapping season cannot start before the young have reached adult age and before the fur has required an acceptable quality. Sealing pelts has also proven to be a good management tool. In keeping with the regulations in effect in most jurisdictions, trappers must have their pelts sealed, specifying the date and place they were taken. This information enables biologists to formulate a harvest inventory based on the sex and age of each animal in order to better manage the fisher and marten populations. When necessary, quotas are established based on the conditions in a given habitat, population tendencies and the age and sex breakdown of the harvest. Biologists finish their analysis by studying the various biological characteristics of the animals revealed through the carcasses that the trappers bring in. This is an important trapper contribution to the study of the marten and fisher populations. Laboratory analysis of the yellow ovarian spots helps biologists estimate potential female reproductive capacity. The work of technicians and biologists is important, but trappers have an equally critical part to play in the management of these two species. Turning carcasses in to biologists is probably the most important contribution trappers can make. However, they can also help themselves by keeping counts of marten and fisher tracks on their trap lines. This data will help the trapper plan the next trapping season. Experienced trappers have learned that they can improve the physical condition of pregnant females by putting out carcasses of beavers or other animals. This food supplement helps the female's diet during the pregnancy and increases the young's chance of survival. Another important aspect of the trapper's role is keeping harvesting statistics. This information is of great help to biologists when they have to set quotas and trapping seasons. If a part of the trap line is on private property, according to the Code of Ethics, the trapper must meet with the landowner before setting any traps. Together, both parties agree on an acceptable method of trapping, taking the location of the property and any other relevant circumstances into consideration. It is always best to obtain written authorization before beginning to trap. The marten and the fisher are both vulnerable species, and management methods must reflect this fact. 
Two important management tools are quota systems along with the sealing of pelts. In addition, an early harvest containing more males and young are a guarantee against over-harvesting. The trapper, as the primary manager of these resources, is the person who can best ensure the application of modern trapping methods.